When you talk to most Americans about the subject of industrial policy, what do they think about? They think about, oh, that means subsidies for underperforming companies that should be out of business that China wants to keep in business, especially state-owned enterprises, which we regard as unfair competition because we don't provide those subsidies to our own companies. When China thinks about industrial policy, they're not thinking about propping up weak companies. They're not thinking about dumping things where we've got a huge inventory. What they're thinking of is, how do we think about the challenges that will make our economy competitive going forward? So if you look at the start of the, the real business or trade-based relationship between the U.S. and China, it really began with China taking advantage of its low-cost labor. Now, China realized that it could not sustain that advantage because other countries in Mexico, but also in Southeast Asia, had lower costs than China did. So China set out to become the global leader in high-end manufacturing, high-value-added manufacturing. And then when we got to, you know, roughly about seven or eight years ago, uh, China made the assertion, which was right and everyone agreed with it, that the battlefield is going to shift to high advanced technologies. So whether it's high-speed rail or whether it's EVs or quantum computing or AI, there were 10 identified high-end technologies. The U.S. clearly realized that China was competitive in a number of those areas because they were making chips available. But the reality is there were a number of areas where China was already taking the lead. And I think today, the best example by far is EVs. I mean, at the end of the day, China was an inconsequential player globally in the automobile manufacturing business if you go back 10, 15 years ago. And so the Chinese government basically set out and said, okay, we're going to figure out what our game plan is. We knew the core challenge was always going to be batteries. So we need to invest in battery technology. And then to the extent they require rare earths like lithium, which they do, we need to start investing in lithium mines. And then they turn to the universities and say, okay, who are the best and the brightest in those spaces at the top universities? And they became part of the team that was working on EVs. And then the same thing on the company side. Who are the companies who are doing cutting edge technologies in those technologies that, that relate to EVs? Well. The story is a pretty compelling one. I mean, today, when you talk to people who go to the uh, Shanghai Auto Show, everybody was uh, paying attention to the Chinese EV companies because they were the most sophisticated, most advanced. It's interesting that the U.S. is now recognizing that in the area of chips, for them to maintain a competitive advantage in the high-end chips, the nano chips, they're going to have to subsidize uh, the chi U.S. chip industries. But the U.S. has no experience in how do you actually bring to fruition an industrial policy. So the ability to actually figure out what companies you want to partner with, who want to get what kind of subsidy, how do you work with universities to tap, tap the best brains is a learned skill. I mean, I could tell you, having spent a lot of years in consulting, getting good at that is something that is not going to happen in a couple of years. It's going to take decades, and China's been doing it for decades. So I think the U.S. is going to realize that, A, industrial policies really are important to a country's long-term economic competitiveness, but it's also a skill that takes many years to develop. So I think you're going to see the U.S. in a catch-up mode and are going to recognize that the way China has approached industrial policy is very compelling from an economic point of view, and there's no better example than what it's done in the EVs.